Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black everything, everything black Culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back Black Welcome to Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal, and we're joined today by historian, associate <laughs> professor Sherry M. Randolph, University of Michigan. How are you doing today, good, Sherry? Good. She's the author of the brand new book, Florence Flo Kennedy, The Life of a Black mm -hmm. Feminist Radical, just published by the University of North Carolina Press. Thanks for joining us here at Left of Black, Sherry. Thank you. Just yesterday. Yes, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, I think every social movement needs a hero, a mm -hmm. mythical figure. Um, in the best case scenario, you know, movements can conjure those figures. Yeah. Um, Flo Kennedy didn't have to be conjured. Um, yeah. She did have to be found, mm, <laughs> right? She nice did have to be excavated. Yeah. Talk about what brought you to Florence Flo Kennedy. Yeah, um, she actually, what's interesting, I. You know, was a feminist. I was a women's studies minor at Spelman College, and I had never heard of Flo, because she never appeared in any books. And it wasn't until I was in grad school, out of college, that I saw a clip of her mm -hmm. on the screen uh, yelling at Daniel Patrick Moynihan. And I knew who he was, but I didn't know who she was. And she was calling him a racist, sexist bastard, <laughs> <laughs> and talking about black power. And he was running from her, and I thought, <laughs> what is this? How? How? What is going on? And uh, and luckily, a person next to me, sitting next to me, watching TV, said, "Oh, that's Florence Bill Kennedy, and she's dead." But she wasn't, because that was in uh, like the '90s, and okay. she was still alive. And what started '96, '97 was more of a hobby yeah. of just collecting information about her. I found Color Me Flow. Her um, memoir, memoir, memoir at the time. And, and there's no YouTube yet, right? So it's not like you could just, <laughs> Ex you know, put her name in the Google, you for right? That. Right. But, right. Exactly. <laughs> so it wasn't like I could Google her. So when I got Color Me Flow, it's just. I mean, you're a historian, you understand that. You're just looking in archives at yeah, that point. You're yeah. looking in real white pages, do you yeah. know? Um, and just asking around. So for the first year, I thought she had passed away because every time I talked to someone, they'd say she passed away. And then finally, I called literally the phone number that was on a flyer <laughs> in Color Me Flow, and she picked up. <laughs> and so it started as a hobby, and then I was in Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham's uh, graduate civil rights class, and sh uh, she said, you should write a paper on this one. Yeah. And yeah. there it started and grew from a dissertation into a now published book. Yeah. What was it about Flo that really attracted you yeah. to her story? I, I have to be honest, um, I, having been a feminist and yeah. I'm also a black nationalist, yeah. I didn't think someone like that existed before mm -hmm. my generation. Does that, does that make that sense? That makes sense, no? Yeah, and so, because it wouldn't make sense to me, because why am I catching so much hell if this had existed before? <laughs> <laughs> why do I seem like such an anomaly? Why does this, the work or what I think I'm a part of seem like such an anomaly and the people that I know mm -hmm. and organize with? And so to hear her black feminism be so stridently, and now I know that that's very much the case because we didn't have Kim Springer's book in the, right. the 90s. Right. We didn't have Benita Roth. So we didn't know much about autonomous black feminist organizations. Right. So I just right. thought feminists lived in my people I knew. Right. <laughs> right. Know? Right. And so I was attracted to someone who was just so stridently black so uh, and connected all of these issues, imperialism, you know, sexism and wanted to end them. And I and, and was chasing Daniel Patrick Moynihan so that who how can you not love someone who's trying to beat him up? So I was very much interested in her for that and then just thought of it as a hobby. I used to do the nineteenth century, so never thought right. to study her. It grew into to that. So, I mean, she is an extraordinary figure and, and you know, you begin her story obviously when she's young yeah. and talk about the examples of her father. Yeah. Right? And it's interesting because we, we often think about, you know, feminist formations or black feminist formations and we don't necessarily think about it as a productive relationship with yeah. men in their lives. And, and Good point. But, you know, it's really her father who kind of fuels her interest in being politically yeah. attuned to what was happening. Yeah, no, and I, it's funny, I, I first struggled with how to frame that, mm. do you know? And then I was like, this is the story, you know? And it's the story she wanted to tell, you know? She was definitely influenced by her mother, her father, her grandmother, her siblings, but her father uh, was, I mean, he renamed his middle name Choice 
do you know, once he came from Alabama, you know, and put it in bold every time. Uh, any document I find with his name, choice is the biggest word on it. And so that's, that's him speaking, do you know, about his choice um, and gave her lessons about standing up for herself, mm -hmm. uh, was armed. Uh, hence, she didn't find that to be t in any way contradictory mm -hmm. to, to militancy. Uh, he, I don't know, can I swear on this program? Oh, absolutely. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so her people would, <laughs> I'm like, I don't know how this works. Um, so she, her family mantra, and she swore a lot and used a lot of profanity because her family said, you know, you don't put up with shit. And that's yeah. her family <laughs> mantra. Take, take no shit. Take no shit, <laughs> right. right, from anyone. So even from middle class, black people, they didn't take shit. And I think that helps flow later on in politics yeah. when you normally yeah. would be, you know, cut under by people who you think are yeah. your allies. She doesn't take shit from white people. She doesn't take shit from kids in her class. And that's a message that her father is constantly saying because he didn't do that in his own personal life. And they, you know, uh, white gangs tried to evict them and he stood up to them. Um, and so she saw that lesson and tried to emulate it uh, in her rhetoric, in her in her actual activism, and in her personal life. And she also saw that in her mother's independence, right? Yeah. Packing up her daughters <laughs> to go visit <laughs> in right. California yeah. and, and then just deciding to stay for two all years. Of a sudden, all of a sudden, right, so you know. Right. And enjoying herself, right? Very much enjoying herself, which was again very, very uh, shocking. Uh, so this is the 19-teens, 1920s, yeah. <laughs> a black woman packing up her three daughters, traveling. Now this is Missouri, getting on a train, going all the way to LA <laughs> um, to visit family, staying there for two years, and you know having extramarital affairs, mm. uh, working for the first time, going out, and did this all. Her, her daughters, who were very young mm -hmm. at the time, knew about this. Uh, hence, I know about it because Flo writes about it uh, in journals in her 20s. So it's, you know, very and, and encouraging them to explore their sexuality. Yes, which, which ex again, is, is, is for that time period, for yeah. that class. Um, her mother grew up middle class. Mm -hmm. um, her, her father had served in the war and, and the, the Civil War. So this was a family that had money that her mother came from. So we don't usually see that. So she encouraged her daughters to to enjoy their bodies. Yeah. I mean, we don't see that a lot with with, with that generation. That I mean, that's a <laughs> radical concept even in 2015. Exactly, right? exactly. So much so that originally when I was writing this book and having people look at it, they asked me, "Was her mother crazy?" Because <laughs> it's it's too it's. That seems too much of an anomaly yeah. that you would let talk to your children about, and we have to assume she talked to them about that because none of their daughters, to our to our knowledge, admit to having children, to, you know, and or raised any children, um, all of them. So we know that they're using birth control at a right. very young, young age. age. Yeah. yeah, but they they talk about kissing boys and exploring and getting in their father's car because they were middle class and they could drive <laughs> their cars to parties and staying out at, late yeah. at night. So that's definitely and not being chastised for it to so much to the point that their mother would let them kind of explore that at home. You know, and you hear this sometimes. You hear parents say mm -hmm. this. This generation, they'll say, you know, if you're going to smoke, if you're going to do those things, I'd rather you do it at home so I right. could right. guide Monitor you. It. Yep. Yeah, and so that's very much what the, her mother supported, and, and this I argue translated for Flo into kind of a, an ability to move and to feel feel very self possessed, um, and to not feel a lot of shame over things that normally black women feel a lot of shame over. You're watching Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're joined today by historian Cherry M. Randolph, University of Michigan, who has just published a wonderful new memoir of Florence Flo Kennedy, Black Feminist Radical. Yes. You know, she eventually ends up in New York. Yeah. Right. And, you know, this is really where she finds the community that she's always been looking for, yeah. that she really becomes radicalized. Um, and it starts very early, right? Again, this is a black woman in the 1940s who's a student at Columbia University. Right, right, right. <laughs> right, so in some ways already kind of an outlier. Yes. Um, decides to pursue law school 
at Columbia. Um, Keep it going. It's you know, okay. gets rejected, um, and and this becomes her first real chance to kind of draw a line in the sand. Yeah. So talk about her application process to yeah. university to come to University Law yeah. School. Yeah. So what's so interesting about Flo Kennedy is she, like you said, she gets to Harlem, uh, decides to go to Columbia. When people, that's pretty rare, pretty rare for an undergrad to go to go to Columbia, a black woman at that. And especially Columbia, because they, they're, you know, it's all male at the time, not very many. Uh, all black, white. It's all white, <laughs> right? You know, not even Jewish candidates at the time. And so this is very rare. So she gets in during the war years because they're looking to women candidates. During that same period, she's like, I want to go to law school. And that's the <laughs> same moment that, you know, the officers from the war are coming back and you know, the university wants their men back. Right, they don't want right. women candidates, so they, they say no to her. So she goes to them and says, you know, I'm, I, I need to make a meeting with you. I think this is racism. Because <laughs> um, it doesn't dawn on her that it's, it's sexism yet. And then they say, no, no, it's not racism. It's not because you're black. It's because you're a woman, and we're saving these, these spaces for, um, for, men. For, men, for men. So don't you feel better? <laughs> and. <laughs> She very quickly, because she's very attuned to these interconnections, says, well, it doesn't make a difference to me. And strategically, she says, black people will see it the same. And I have loads of people who are going to see this as racism. And lo and behold, she's one of the handful of, of women who get in that right. year. And the other women who get in are usually just professors, daughters, and so forth. So she's the only black woman there yeah. at, that, at that moment in that class. So she definitely pushes the edge yeah. very early on, you know, and gets in because of it. And then, of course, she's challenged by, you know, what does she do with this degree, right? Because right. she can't go into a New York law firm, no. right? So eventually she sets up her own shop. Yeah, yeah. And that part of the story is incredibly fascinating mm. when you start to see some of the people that, that she, she begins to represent. Yeah. Um, starting with Billie Holiday. Isn't that, I mean, and, and you have to think, uh, I know we now think Billie Holiday, you know, all of these great musicians, but they're really, if you think of the cabaret laws right. and all, they're being targeted. They're the right. ones who need, they right. have money. The narcotics laws. Exactly, right. the narcotics right. laws that are, are, are forcing them not to work. And right. Holiday's been politicized because of strange fruit, right? So she has HUAC folks looking at her. All the time. Right. And so she's constantly a, a person who needs a lawyer for her political acts that are getting kind of, uh, you know, kind of coached in or, or bridled in kind of a, a, an idea that it's drugs and it's just right. drugs. At least right. that's what Flo right. argues and, and many activists at that time argue. So they need lawyers. And so Flo becomes her lawyer th through that um, and works with her when she's, when she, to make sure that she's able to spend her last days uh, in a hospital before she dies because they wanted to put her arrest in prison, her. arrest right. her. She's able to, uh, uh, many of the little tiny just nuisance uh, litigation that happens flows a part of and really it's in this moment that Flo is on the scene as a as a lawyer to black people because she's yeah. now in the Amsterdam news and the press as a lawyer who defends the rights and she's very you know outspoken about that and so she was like you know make sure you look at your contracts and she's saying this in the press so more and more black musicians producers she, she ends up providing counsel for the estates of both billy holiday and charlie parker exactly right? and a lot of i mean a lot of people we don't even think of a lot of writers because in this moment uh you know say you go to cbs and you say i have a tv show uh here's an idea cbs could just take it yeah, Do you know? Right. So we don't know how to actually right. litigate that. And so Flo is really standing up for them. And, and, and one of the things I think is really interesting, you know, the way that you describe some of the work that she's doing in the mm -hmm. early 60s around intellectual property. Yeah. Right. You know, she's actually protecting the creative rights and intellectual property exactly. of, of black artists, musicians, producers at a time when no one would think ever to protect them. Right? Exactly. And she's very much interested in that, sometimes doing it pro bono so, and a lot of times doing it unsuccessfully. Right. But she sees this, and in this time, she's really getting her chops ready for, because we think of Flo Kennedy later on as, you know, boycott, consumer boycotts, boycott every <laughs> TV station, do you know? And this is that moment where she's understanding how the media works. Uh, and later on now, we couldn't imagine in L.A. or New York not thinking about entertainment law. Right. But she's thinking right. about it at a very early time when no one cares really about black artists and artists uh, you know, the writers, the producers, you know, in that moment. 
she's engaging the activists in Mississippi. Yeah. Right, right. Wednesdays in, in, Mississippi. in Mississippi. Yeah, she's everywhere. <laughs> uh, she is involved in the Black Power yeah. Convention in 1967. Yeah. Um, you know, she's advocating, providing counsel for Adam Clayton Powell. Yeah, I just, <laughs> it's like what? when you know when when the House doesn't want to seat him, yeah. right? Yeah, you know, there's She's a way. She's forming protests. <laughs> and, and when you hear, for instance, someone like Kimberly Crenshaw talk about intersectionality. Mm -hmm. 20 years after this period, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, in many ways, Flo Kennedy is ground zero for that intersectionality. Like that, yeah. When when you think about her involvement with now, with the Black pa with the Black Panthers, right? Mm -hmm. You know, defending, you know, uh, Asada, yeah, <laughs> or, or part of her. Yeah, um, you know, I was struck at that moment where you talk about her talking with Asada. It's like also pay attention to to Afeni, right? Because <laughs> she has this unpregnant child, and it's like. <laughs> Okay, this is a woman who, in some sort of interesting <laughs> space, is in the same room as Billie Holiday, Charlie <laughs> Parker, and Tupac. Right. right. And an unborn <laughs> Tupac. It's like, you, you can't the make this- The very same room. You right. can't make this shit up, right? I never thought about it that way. <laughs> and right? so she's like the, the ground zero for everything that we understand right. about intersectionality, yeah. right? And I wonder, does that hmm. add to the fact mm. that it's been so hard to find her? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you for getting my book. I, I appreciate that. I'm like listening to you. I'm like, you get this. You get what I'm doing. You know. Um, yes, I think it's. I think it's a both and. I think because she's everywhere, the FBI doesn't take her seriously. Because right, she's a black woman. She's a black woman. They're right. following right. her. Right, and I she's mean, not. Or she's not part of the major organizations exactly. in that way. Exactly. Right. She's a shapeshifter. Right. She's going in and out of all of these movements. Right. right. And, and in them, she's here. One organization, she's fundraising. One organization, she's being a mentor. One organization, she's really involved. So they, you know, and in one day, she's going from, you know, with her suitcase from organization to organization. <laughs> and so they can't really put a finger on her. So I even find that sometimes they think, well, is she stealing from them? Do you know, like, is she, is she really giving, she fundraised $20, but should she really take the $20? Do you know, literally it says that, and it's like $20. So I think because she moves so much, mm -hmm. you know, organizers can't place her sometimes. But I think the people who can place her are the people she organized with in Harlem, in New York, who are doing the Dorothy Pittman Hughes, the, yeah. do you know, the Florence Rice, who look just like her. Their activism right, is right, everywhere, these right. black feminists. What, the photo that you have in the book of Florence Rice, yeah. Right, 2008, <laughs> right. Finally admitted. I, I, I had an abortion. abortion. Right. Right. She's 90 something years right. old. Right, right. Still, finally, I can tell the truth when you've been an abortion rights activist, but right. the, do you know, but you finally are coming out with your own story. So I think you're right. I think because Flo was a shapeshifter, which I think is a great word for this, I think it was hard to place her. I think people couldn't understand that. She's yeah. also an older black woman. She yeah. doesn't fit the model of black power. She doesn't fit the model of a woman's movement. She doesn't fit the model of consumer rights. She doesn't fit any model. Right. Do you know? And I think that's hard for historians one to, to see her. And, and she knew when she had to kind of nudge back, particularly at the black power movement, right? Yeah. So the essay that she writes in, in abortion rap. Yeah. And, and she is careful to articulate you know, she's talking about reproductive rights, but yet what's coming out of black nationalist circles yeah. is that, you know, genocide. Planned Parenthood yeah, <laughs> is, is black genocide, right? Yeah. And she has to find a way to nuance that conversation. Exactly. Right? Which is, I mean, and, and it also speaks to a black feminist who's, who's trained in black power. Right. That's her, and I think that, because so many people think of, if you know Flo, and if you know Flo at all, you think of her as the one or the t one of the few black feminists who worked in now with white feminists. Mm -hmm. So you don't think of her as being connected to black people, which, is, which isn't the case. And so she, she gets her marching orders from black power and from the black freedom movement. And so you see her very conscious of how do I, well, I don't want to say not offend because she doesn't care whether she offends someone, but how do I not close off an audience? Right. And I actually believe that uh, there's genocide going on. I don't believe that that genocide is legalizing abortion. And so how do I get this message across yeah, and also yeah. criticize that argument? And also, and I think we forget this, and you see this in a lot of the writings on, on, when you do see black feminism or black women come up, 
they're only talking to black power men. No, black power women thought this too. So right. Flo never got caught up in that either. Right. Most people she's interacting with are both men. Believe, black. Right, believe some of the same things. Right? Exactly. So she has to be very nuanced. You're right, and 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 straddling that fence. And she's in a crowd of, of women who feel similarly. You know, Eleanor Holmes Norton and you know Dorothy Pittman Hughes. She's having conversations. She's not alone. Um, and um, so she's both reflecting the moment and, and, and pulling it forward. Yeah. You're watching Left of Black. We're joined today by historian Cherry M. Randolph, University of Michigan Associate Professor of History, the author of a brand new memoir, or excuse me, biography, biography yeah. of, of Florence Flo Kendi. Um, she has a media career, right? Yeah. She's doing radio <laughs> through the 1960s, and then there's the Flo Kennedy show. Yeah, that's and, and, still in In the 1980s, and, and it's, you know, pulling some of that up from the archive and just seeing the range of folks that she's talking to. Yeah. You know, it's a conversation with her and Doc, and Doc Ben. And it's like, okay, yeah, that- you saw that. that. <laughs> it's like, okay, this, this is kind of some interesting groundbreaking shit right here. Yeah, Jesse Jackson. <laughs> right. But I wonder when we think about Flo Kennedy now, um, yeah. you know, would Flo have been on Twitter. Ah, uh, if okay, if if she could have figured it out or figured out, had someone figure it out for her, and she because she was very. This is what's key about her, and I think a lot of uh, of radical activists. Um, she was very oral, you mm -hmm. know, and so even her her memoir, Color That's Me Flow, right. her speeches, she oftentimes would maybe do a hand thing, but they were recorded and then made into and something. Right. And so I think for her and Twitter, someone would have had to figure out how to get her orally <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> translated. <laughs> and I think you could even see that with some activists now. I think uh, activists who are really good writers, but then you see them in person. Right. Yeah, so Twitter <laughs> opens that forum, I think. So I don't know. I, she would have to have had a side buddy helping her with that. <laughs> what would she say to Black Lives Matter, right? Yeah. If, she, if she could provide counsel yeah. A wide range of counsel, political, legal, what have you. What would she say to Black yeah, Lives no, Matter? Yeah, no, and I've thought about that a lot because I've I've watched Black Lives Matter and thinking and think that's Flo Kennedy. You know, <laughs> the in-your-face activism, the the you know, or even seeing uh, uh, you know the climbing the pole, taking down the Confederate right. flag, all those shock tactics. Flo believed in shock tactics. Mm -hmm. She said you got to gain the media's attention, and right. Black Lives Matter has been gaining the media's attention. They've been keeping. You see what they're doing with the presidential race. They're keeping that conversation right, in it. Right. You cannot ignore them. Um, I think what she would say is, because she was a mentor that was hands off. Okay. Do you know? And I think Ella I, Baker like in that regard. It, Ella Baker like in that regard. Uh, but Ella, Ella Baker tended to work pointedly with several organizations, but hands off. Flo tended to be everywhere, <laughs> you know, in and out um, at certain points in her career. Um, so I think what she would say to Black Lives Matter is keep it up. Mm -hmm. Do you know, more shock tactics, mm -hmm. you know, involve more people, go, you know, be even more frustrating, even more infuriating. Because um, that's what she, I mean, she would sometimes advocate things that now, when I would listen to them, I'd laugh, but, you know, <laughs> a peeing at Harvard because they had no bathrooms for right. women. Do you know, she would advocate, and, and mind you, she never really did any of these things. Right. She would just, the fear, the media attention, putting out that press release and saying there's <laughs> a million of us going out and then there'd be 10 of her friends. Do you know, and it would get attention and then she would get the issues out there. So I think she would, uh, advocate even more outrageous actions to get media attention and to get pull people to your side as well. Yeah. We've been joined today by Professor Sherry M. Randolph, Associate Professor of History, University of Michigan, the author of the new book, Florence Flo <laughs> Kennedy, The Life of a Black Radical Feminist, mm -hmm. uh, just published by the University of North Carolina Press. Thank yeah. you for joining us. Thank again, you. Sherry. Thank you for having me. Black lights and booze burn when I record for Watts and every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. All black everything, everything black, culture over everything.